Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I, I, the, I'm, this is an entirely self-indulgent moment, I'm afraid, but um, you're going to have two people introducing today's lecture. Um, I was supposed to be uh, hosting uh, this event, Robert, today, but um, as you may have heard, I got asked to do a piece of work by the government, and I don't actually know what's involved, and finally Downing Street have asked me to come in so they can tell me what's involved. So I think I ought to go to that meeting, really, because I'm a bit embarrassed about telling people I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and so I've had to, I'm having to go there, which means I won't be chairing the event. And, but I wanted just to welcome Robert because I've been near, here nearly 10 years now, and when I came, one of the first things I wanted to do was to bring in some new types of speakers to our events. And uh, my recollection is that the first one of those events that really felt it was different and we were talking about different kinds of things was you, Rob, when you came 10 years ago. And uh, ever since then, I think our events programme has gone from strength to strength. But um, I'll always be grateful to you for starting it all off. And I will now hand over to Rowan Conway, who has got the privilege of chairing today's event. So over to you, Rowan. Thank you, Matthew. So I do the more formal thing and try and work out how to say the hashtag is RSA Pre-Suede. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I am Rowan Conway. I'm Director of Development here at the RSA. Um, thank you for joining us today for today's special lunchtime event. Before we begin, can I ask you to turn your mobiles to silent? Um, we're filming today and live streaming over the web, so welcome to those of you who are joining us online. And again, the RSA hashtag is RSA pre suede and I think you have to have that pre in uppercase for some reason. Um, so please do join the discussion on Twitter. Without any further ado, because now you've had two people introducing you, um, it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Robert Cialdini. Um, Dr. Cialdini is Regents Professor Emeritus of Psychology and Marketing at Arizona State University. He spent his entire career researching the science of influence and is the world's leading expert in the fields of persuasion and negotiation. His renowned book, Influence, has sold over three million copies in a New York Times bestseller and has been published in over 30 languages. His long-awaited new book, which you can um, purchase a copy outside, is uh, on the science of persuasion, and it's just out and it's been met with critical and popular acclaim. He joins us today to give us a glimpse into the fruits of the last 30 years of his research. I, for one, can't wait to hear a bit more about it. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Cialdini. Thank you, Ron. Thank you very much. And yes, I do want to talk about something other than persuasion. I want to talk about the process of persuasion, which opens the door to persuasion. Um, it does so by allowing us to get an audience sympathetic with our message before they encounter it. Now that sounds like some kind of magic. How could we get someone to agree to a message when they don't know what's in it. But it's not magic. It's established science. A communicator can get us to be agreeable to a message that we haven't yet heard by going to the moment before they deliver that message and putting us in a frame of mind that is aligned with the central element of that message. Now, I want to talk about this in a couple of ways. I want to talk about it today, first of all, in a, in a way that convinces you of the power of this process, and secondly, that allows you to harness that power in your own attempts to achieve your professional goals. Uh, so, Let's begin with an example um, that comes not from a professional setting, but from a more personal setting, because I want to show the universality of this principle. And it has to do with a, a study that was done in France. Researchers had uh, a pretty young woman approach middle-aged men who were walking down a street and, um, and ask for help with um, directions to a street. About 100 yards later, they were approached by another attractive young woman right, 
who had a much larger request. She said, you see those four guys over there? And she pointed to four tough-looking young men. They've taken my t cell phone, and they won't give it back. Could you go get it for me? <laughs> well, the majority of these guys said, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know this mademoiselle. They didn't know if that was really her phone. And if in any confrontation, they would be outnumbered four to one. So the great majority of them, 80%, said, no, no thank you. I'm not going to help. Uh, and uh, all right. So we see that in this particular sample of middle-aged men walking alone, only 20% said, yeah, 20% is still impressive. But we would know why. That was an attractive young woman. Physical attractiveness leads to yes when a communicator has that particular trait. Right? But there was a second sample of men who were nearly twice as likely to go to the damsel's distress. 37% of them launched themselves into this confrontation. What was the difference? You remember what happened to these men 100, yard, 100 meters earlier? Y yards, we're still in. <laughs> I was just in Warsaw. I was talking in meters. Yards earlier. They were asked for directions. The first sample was asked for directions to Martin Street, the second sample to Valentine Street. <laughs> Why did that make a difference? Because previous research showed that being asked about directions to Valentine Street put men in mind of a romantic holiday, Valentine's Day. And when they were in an amorous state of mind, romance became more important to them than danger. Now, just to be sure that this wasn't an example of some form of middle-aged male foolishness, these researchers tried the same thing with women as the subjects. In this case, young women who were walking in a shopping mall. Oh, wait a minute. Before we do that, let me ask you this question. What percentage of those guys, those 37%, right, who said yes, what percentage of them do you think recognized that they had been moved by that persuasive action? of being asked for directions to Valentine Street. Notice that the big increase didn't, wasn't because of physical attractiveness. Something else was required to produce. In other words, a persuasive step. They had to be asked about something that was associated with romance in order to prioritize romance now. What percentage do you think recognized that? How many people would say everybody did? How many people would say, oh, well, maybe half? Half, right? How many, a quarter of them would recognize? Right? How many, okay, 10%. None. No one. No one. That's what makes this such an unconscious um, process we don't recognize its influence on us because it comes before the request. We're not focused on the moment before. We're focused here on the request. And so this flies under the radar, makes it important for us to think about the ethics of this process. But let's go back to that, uh, that situation I was describing uh, in a shopping mall in uh, France. Right? This time, 
The researchers, it was the same researchers, they had, instead of an attractive young woman, a very attractive young man who walked up to, to women who were, who were uh, passing various shops in the mall and stopped them, gave them a compliment, and asked for their phone number so he could call to arrange a date later. Another risky request. To give a phone number to a perfect stranger who simply approaches in a shopping mall? Risky. Right? And under those circumstances, depending on the shop, as people were passing various shops, these young women, a, a shoe store, a clothing boutique, a pastry shop, the young man had very little success, only about 13.5% of the time. Did he actually get a phone number? But when the young women were passing another kind of shop, right, his success doubled almost. Any idea what that shop would be? Chocolates? No, not quite. Jewelry? Maternity? No, not maternity. <laughs> Why? Because flowers are associated with romance. And when they were put in a romantic state of mind, romance became more important than risk for them. Think about this. We're able to change who people are in the moment after we focus their attention on a particular idea. You can make me a romantic by presenting information, drawing my attention to information about romance. In that moment, you will have changed who I am. I am now a romantic in a way that I wasn't before. Now, one more thing about this study that I like. It's that afterward, the young women were asked, of all the uh, shops that you passed, which were the products inside that you liked the most? Right? And their answer was the pastries. But the pastries didn't produce phone numbers. Flowers produced phone numbers. Why? Because romance is associated with flowers, not frosted donuts, right? <laughs> you see how the alignment of the, what is made top of consciousness, top of mind in the moment before the request is crucial to the success of that request. The alignment has to be right. OK. Now, let's talk about how this would apply, how a communicator would apply this uh, in other, perhaps, professional settings. Because, ladies, I'm pretty sure that the most important persuasive appeals that you make in your professional uh, lives don't involve getting your cell phone back on the streets of Marseille. And gentlemen, I'm going to assume that the most important persuasive appeals for you don't involve getting phone numbers from romantic possibilities in a shopping mall, right? Gentlemen? <laughs> so what, what can we do as communicators? Here's what a communicator does to engage the process of persuasion most effectively. It occurs in two steps. The first is to identify the precise goal of the communication. What is it that is the strength, the, 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 the purpose of this communication? What is it designed to accomplish? And then, to create a mindset 
in the recipient of the message that hasn't even occurred yet, the message hasn't occurred, right? Right. that is consistent with that goal right? through the words, situations, or images that are presented in that earlier moment. We've already talked about two of these words. The word Valentine, the situation, flower shop. Let's consider another uh, goal, more professional. The goal of creating top performance from others and ourselves and see how images can create that effect. Uh, the goal of, of generating top performance, that's something we want uh, for ourselves. We want that for our teams. Right? And uh, in many business uh, settings that I've visited, there are often posters on the walls that, that cue the idea of top performance. Uh, call centers uh, tend to be uh, one. You see these kinds of posters. How many of you have seen these posters, been in offices that maybe your own? Right? A lot of people think that this is silly to do this. I was one of those people, always thought it was only laughable that having a, 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 a poster that says achievement or challenge or conquer or dream big would make a difference. There are other kinds of posters. Sometimes you just see the word conquer, right? overcome, succeed. Sometimes you just see a photograph, just the image, like this one, a runner winning a race. I always thought that was laughable. Not anymore. Because I have seen the stud a study that was done by some Canadian researchers. Right? They went to a call center. These were, we see these kinds of posters all the time. And they arranged for the callers who were trying to get contributions that particular day, they were calling to get contributions from, for a local university from former alumni. And they were given a, a sheet of, of topics to, uh, to cover in their presentation once they got one of these uh, potential donors on the phone, a tip sheet. Right? And half of them were given that tip sheet to call, and uh, it was on plain paper. And about, they gained about $217 during the three-hour shift they next um, uh, engaged in. Another group was given that, sh that same sheet of topics with the background of that runner winning the race. Three hours later, they had averaged about 60, excuse me, 60% 60 better performance because the concept of success, of achievement, was made prominent in their consciousness before they began the task. Now, that's a little unsettling, but remarkable right, to me and I asked the question to myself, but maybe this, go how long could this last? How long could it be that you see this image and that influences? Well, those researchers then did another study that answered my question. They had the same thing happen for four days, right? And they found the same increase on the fourth day as they did on the first day. Okay. So as long as we are gaining access to a particular concept, a particular idea, that is going to focus our attention in a way that makes subsequent activity, subsequent information um, uh, uh, congruent with that idea. All right. Now, that's for one particular kind of top performance. But there are other kinds of top performance that don't require some kind of energy-fueled, uh, persistent uh, drive toward a goal, but require a different kind of 
performance. Deliberation, analysis, considered uh, uh, concern about the details or the complexity of a problem, where you don't want to just rush through it, you want to step back from it and consider it in all of its uh, uh, complexity. So these Canadian researchers did a second study to see if they could energize top performance for that kind of task. Right? What they did was to give business students a set of difficult problems to solve, right? ask them to solve a, a variety, a set of these problems within a certain amount of time, and for some, they were shown uh, essentially a nature scene in the background of the computer while they were doing this task. This is the kind of thing that we typically put on, our, on the screens of our, uh, uh, of our computers. Another group was given, indeed, this uh, energy-fueled kind of uh, success image. But remember, they wanted deliberation. They wanted concentrated analysis here. Any idea what kind of image would be associated with that? that they could use. Here's the one that the Canadian researchers chose. Rodin's The Thinker. Now, each were given the opportunity to solve these problems. And let's look at the number that they got correct within this difficult, within this period. Nature scene, about 6.6. Runner winning the race, the one that had been so successful previously, nothing, nothing significant. But Roden's thinker, slowly, 39.3%. Now it's a 48%. So once again, we see the precision that has to be involved here. The alignment has to be right between what it is that you put in the moment before and what comes next. Hmm? All right, now, I know we're almost out of time, so let me talk about one more goal. Creating a feeling of unity or togetherness. Right? That's a big issue that we all have. Right? Before we leave that one, let me suggest that, that earlier one on performance, this isn't just something that we get to use on others. We get to use this on ourselves. Do you have a task that requires a lot of persistence and energy and drive? Put a picture of a runner winning the race in the corner of the, you have one that requires a lot of analysis, deliberation. Put a picture of Rodin's thinker. You will do better in both instances, provided that you change the image, the cue that is steering you into that activity. Right? Now, let's talk about this one. This is uh, establishing a feeling of togetherness, something we all want to do in our teams, uh, sometimes even with people that we deal with outside of our organizations. We want that sense, sense of uh, of uh, commonality and unity. Uh, and a study was done in Belgium right, that makes the case of how this one might be generated. Uh, researchers had subjects come into an experiment. One third of them were shown photographs of household objects and in the background of the objects was a single figure standing alone. Another third in the background were two figures standing apart from one another, separate. A final third, those same two figures standing shoulder to shoulder together. In, all right, activating, raising to consciousness the idea of, of togetherness, collaboration, cooperation. Then, in all instances, the researcher got up from the table and accidentally dropped a series of items onto the floor. And the question is, now, who gets down on their knees spontaneously, without being asked, and helps the researcher pick these 
uh, items up. Who has been stimulated into a, I, the notion of togetherness and cooperativeness? Right? And as you can guess, I'm sure by now, those who saw someone standing alone, 20% helped. Those stand, saw people standing apart, 20%. Those who saw those figures standing together, three times as much. We've done it again, but we've changed the idea. We've changed the concept that was top of mind and produced the consequent behavior that's congruent with that concept. Now, this study rocked me back in my chair when I read it. Not because of these results, because by the time I had read this study, I had already seen those other kinds of results that we've been talking about. Because of something about the subjects in this experiment. The subjects, including those who were three times as likely to help because they saw an image of togetherness, the subjects were 18 month old children, hardly able to speak, to talk, barely able to review or reflect or reason. And they were powerfully mobilized by this process of persuasion. It tells us how fundamental, how primitive this process is, how it operates at us at very basic levels. All right, let me finish with one more example of how you might employ this idea of togetherness without having to show people images of individuals standing shoulder to shoulder. Suppose you want someone, you want support for, from someone who um, will be, <laughs> will be helpful in the future if you can get that person's support for a new idea or an initiative or a program that you have in mind. And one thing that we are trained to do is to go to that person and, and ask for that person's opinion on an early draft or a blueprint of this idea. Can you, what, what do you think about this, right? That's a mistake. Not to go to that person. The mistake is to ask for his or her opinion. Because what the research tells us is that when you ask for someone's opinion, that person takes a half step back from us psychologically and goes inside, introspects, separates from us. If instead, you ask for that person's advice persuasively. He or she takes a half step toward us in a collaborative state of mind. They now encounter our evidence. And the evidence is of the, the research is quite clear. They now become more supportive of our idea because we have made them a part of it, caused them to step into that idea with us rather than back from us as a dispassionate reviewer of that idea. Small thing, one small change produces the effect. Okay, let's, let's wind up here. This is the evidence that they showed that when, when people say, give me your opinion, and they rate how they and the, the, um, uh, uh, the other individual uh, are together, they separate. When you ask for their advice, they rate themselves as closer to the other person. It's not that, oh, when I was asked for my, for my advice, I considered myself more helpful, no. Asked about opinion, asked about advice, produces the same level of perceived helpfulness. The difference is the per perceived unity that asking for advice rather than it. Right? So there's an old saying that when people, 
When you, when you look for, when you ask for someone's advice, you're usually asking for an accomplice, right? Here's what the behavioral research says. If you get that advice, you get that accomplice. Okay, let's finish. All right, here's a communicator can change what I'm paying attention to and in the process change who I am in that moment. If you are that communicator, I'll be at your disposal in that moment. Therefore, we would both benefit from knowing more about this process. And I hope that the information you've heard today begins to help provide that, that knowledge in this regard. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Robert. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, there was a lot about togetherness there, and that's, um, that's a very interesting place for us to start, I think, in the Q&A. Um, because you said collaboration is a state of mind, and you're asking for an accomplice. Now, I think that's really interesting, because that denotes a relationship or a longer-term thing that you're moving into. And so it goes slightly beyond the kind of marketing visual cues and the, how, you, how you create the conditions. But something... Um, came up to me when you were saying, you know, the best use of these tools is when we're thinking about our performance for ourselves and for others. Because I, a slight, I, I had a slight worry when you were talking about Valentine's Day being used and, and some of the subtle subconscious or pre-conscious things that you were doing there with those individuals, that that could be seen as manipulation. So if you are using these tools and you're arranging the state of mind of an audience... How do we ensure that the impacts of those actions on your audience are positive? You know, how do, when, you've, when you've got an accomplice, how do you then move forward with that accomplice? What's the commitment you're making? Yeah, this is really a central question that I have been thinking about with all, with regard to this, because indeed it occurs so unconsciously. We have to think about the ethical implications of being able to move people all around without their knowledge of what's happened. We saw what happened in, in the case of the, the, the guys and uh, no, not one of them recognized that this was happening. So what, what can we do to assure that this is uh, ethical? Here's the best way, I, I'm not sure that it's, it, it's an optimal way, but when I said we have to identify the, the most uh, precise goal or feature, the strength of our message that we want people to be focused on, it should be something that would cause that person to make a wise choice in our direction. Not something that would lead to our greater profit, but would if they are focused on this thing, let's say um, we have a lot of research uh, evidence in favor of uh, our, uh, our proposal or our product or our service, our idea, uh, a lot of experience in that arena, we should put the idea of authority or expertise or, or, or competence that should be the image. So people will go to the thing that is most true and most representative of what we have to offer that makes it wise for them to move in that direction. Uh, the other thing is to be sure that uh, uh, as an organization, we don't allow uh, the individuals inside our, our organization to use these strategies uh, in an unethical way because I think there are very consequential and negative um, outcomes associated with uh, an organization that allows itself to have an unethical uh, culture. Absolutely. I, w I was thinking, did that guy go out with the 24% of people who said yes and gave them him her, their number? 
it was all part of a, a research study, <laughs> so none of them. None uh, of them got a day. But I have to say, I had the same I kind of pause when uh, I saw those results. Uh, is this, is this uh, uh, informing uh, people of ways to uh, use persuasion as an artifice, mm -hmm. as a device? to get goals that are not in the best interests of the recipient, but only in the best interests. I, I have real uh, concerns about that. Because mm. I think what I'm hearing you say is that it's about mutuality rather than about sort of uni unilateral yeah. power in that way. Um, because emotions are involved in those, in those decision making. I'm interested- Also risk. We got people to take risky stances. Yeah, you've got, you've got four blokes he was going to have yeah, a fight with. You yeah. know, that's quite challenging. Very risky. Um, we are seeing, you know, since the, the arrival of, sort of behavioural sciences and the, um, the nudge unit over here, starting to look at these ways that these can be deployed in public sector arena as well as, as this. These are, these are tools that have, you know, been used traditionally in a corporate sector or in a corporate environment. Is there a different way? Are there different things that, or concerns that need to be thought about between the corporate sector and the public sector? Yeah. Uh, so we did a series of studies to suggest that, it, that uh, in the corporate sector, we have to be particularly concerned about this. Uh, but that is, that's where we did the research. But in the private sector as, as well, I mean, excuse me, the governmental public sector as well, because um, trust of one's citizenry is the basis for a democracy. If we start running games, tricks uh, on the, the citizenry of, uh, uh, of a country, that risks, that puts at peril the very basis of a democratic uh, and willing um, exchange between uh, the, the government and, and the, the citizens themselves. So that's something that we have to be very careful about. And I think the nudge unit, for the most part here in the UK, has been mindful of that. Mm -hmm. No, it's definitely been looking at that kind of process improvement rather than actually trying to be persuasive necessarily in, in other ways. Right. Um, I'm going to come to the floor, so please start putting your hands up. So I will come to the lady in the front here, then the gentleman in the middle, and then the gentleman with the paper coming up. But I'm going to ask one more question before we do that. Um, we're at a particularly interesting time, in specifically in political debate, both here, um, but, but right now, you know, there was an election debate yesterday. Um, how do you think political candidates can use these tools without, as you say, trying to un unnerve the populace, um, engage more effectively with audiences? I'll tell you something that the Obama campaign did very successfully back in 2008 when no one knew this guy. He's uh, a one-term senator uh, from Illinois, not a very uh, a prominent figure in politics. And all of a sudden, this, this African-American guy who no one knew produced a lot of uncertainty in people about whether they should support him. And one of the things that we know from behavioral science is that to reduce uncertainty, people look around at how many other people have decided to do something that they're being in, encouraged to do. And what the Obama campaign did that was brilliant right, was to, instead of having the candidate stand behind a set of flags of the you know, there was a set of a sea of faces that was arranged so that every demo demographic category was represented in that face. You saw Asians, you saw old people, you saw young people, you saw, you, you saw people dressed in suits and ties, you saw people in t-shirts. The idea was look at all of the people who have decided that this is the right guy, and I can find myself in there. There will be someone in there who looks like me. The second thing they did that I haven't, I haven't seen anybody do since, and nor before. In the United States, every political campaign has to announce how much money they received right, in any given month or quarter right, from donors. 
And what the campaigns always did was to respond to that particular directive. Tell us how much money you've given. They all did that. What the Obama campaign did, before they stated the amount, they stated the number of contributors. Look at all of the people who have contributed to us. It reduced uncertainty that this was someone we should be considering seriously, at least someone whose attention deserve it, we, who deserves our attention because of the, uh, m the multitude who have already decided to do this. That was a brilliant, persuasive mm -hmm. strategy on their part, I thought. Absolutely. Okay, have you got, been given a microphone? Thank you. Um, Angela Harvey, I'm a fellow. I was going to ask that very same question. <laughs> so I'm going to switch to what should have happened in the referendum here, therefore? that got a slightly different result to the one that people expected. Yeah, and, I, and I'm not very, I'm not as familiar with UK politics, but if I were to take a persuasive approach to this, those who wanted stay right, should have elevated to conscious, this, uh, this um, vote, should have been about all the things that are associated with stay, stability, predictability, uh, uh, exchange, uh, cooperate, co international cooperation. These kinds of things should not just have been in their messages. They should have been made top of consciousness before the message about each of those things was delivered. There should have been symbols, there should have been words, there should have been situations depicted that created that mindset because that mindset channels people into the concept that is aligned with that mindset and gives it special leverage, special traction when the message itself is delivered. Gentlemen, do you have a microphone? Hi, thank you. This is uh, Virin from Chain School. I just wanted to understand, uh, this is, is, is what you're talking about taking the notion of priming further in terms of aligning it with uh, communicators' goals or motives, or is it something quite different? Sorry, it's new no, to it, me. No, it's, it's very much alike priming. I, uh, so not everyone knows priming, but it, it's very similar to what I'm suggesting. What you activate in a person's consciousness in at any one time, then colors their perceptions and directs their perceptions in a way that is uh, congruent. Now, that also applies to other kinds of literatures within behavioral science, the, the, the literature on framing, the literature on anchoring, and so on. So what I talk about is rather than primes, I talk about openers. How do we open the moment before our message so that people are now receptive to it. I don't know if you noticed in my very first frame, there was a door <laughs> that opened. That was, I, wa I wanted that image to be part of the consciousness of the audience because I was talking about something that required a, a new way of thinking something that required us to open ourselves to, to an idea that hadn't really been widely um, uh, communicated before. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I plead guilty to uh, employing the, the same strategy. I think it's interesting. I, I had another question that, that builds exactly on that. In your book, you, you talk about the media's use of these kind of tools, and you talked about how issues that gain attention gain kind of presumed importance, which is that same sort of priming arena. There was one interesting thing that you talk about where you talk about the embedded reporter program in the Iraq war um, that was sponsored, I believe, by the US military um, to some degree. And it was incredibly persuasive. Um, mm. it, it, had it had a profound impact and it dominated the news. Um, it also, to a certain extent, it limited the range of debate around the conduct of war rather than the wisdom of war. So you are framing the debate when you have to use these tools um, ubiquitously. So I'm interested in how, when using these tools, or how we can think about to ensure that public debate is not, not 
narrowed by too much orchestration, but actually can, that can still be flourish in a, in a wider range of ideas and diverse thought? Well, I, I think we can count on our uh, opinion opponents to, to be sure that, that, that uh, their points are uh, a part of the consciousness. But I think, again, in, in terms of how we can do this in a way that is justifiable, is to ask people to think about those features of our message that make it wisest <laughs> for them to move in our directions, that, that our, our, our strengths. Right? So we focus them on our strengths and they are informed about the best arguments in our uh, camp. Uh, our opponents can focus them on other arguments, uh, but um, I think that's the job of a communicator, to be sure that people are not um, focused away from the central issues that ought to be in mind when they make a decision. Very often, and we're seeing this in the United States now with, with uh, the campaigns, people's focus is not on the issues. It's, it's on the entertainment value and the outrageous character of the very many aspects of the debate. That's a mistake. We need to be sure that people think about those debates in terms uh, not of these superficial and, and, um, and uh, extraneous factors, but on the ones that are going to make the most difference for us as a, as a society. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so the gentleman over there with the card held up, and then if you can pass your mic back to the lady behind you. Oh, no, that's now gone in a different way. So the lady there in that third row, and then we'll come to you. So. Thank you. I'm wondering whether the, um, the implication of the last example you gave us about togetherness was, in fact, an indication that we should all live under socialism. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Hardly. I think what we could say is that in a capitalistic uh, exchange, what we want is people who are willing to compromise who are willing to be uh, of assistance to one another, to cooperate and collaborate, rather than to take uh, an adversarial point of view. Uh, and uh, and we, we're, we're more likely to produce joint benefit under those circumstances. Uh, so uh, uh, I don't think that it's uh, one or the other, but I'll give you an example, a personal one. Uh, we have a, a business and uh, we talk about, uh, we have clients who are interested in learning about the science of uh, influence. We were having a meeting with uh, one set of clients and typically what happens is we bring our team into the meeting room and we sit at one end of the table and then the clients come in and they bring their team and they sit at the other end of the table, right? on the other side. That's the geography of separation. That's the geography of difference. So what I asked my team to do is to take every other chair around the table. And now when our clients came in, they sat among us. And we had a very profitable Negotiation, not saying that's the only reason, but this is the sort of thing that we can do within uh, uh, an exchange in which we, we, want, uh, we both want good things, but we can do so by structuring the situation so that at top of mind is the idea of uh, cooperation. Sounds a bit like socialism. <laughs> <laughs> Lady there. Hello, I'm, uh, I'm Penny Bickerstaff. I'm a fellow here too. And uh, I guess that's really helpful that you, that you went into the meeting place because I was wanting to ask a kind of micro question. 
I spend a lot of, of time with clients where it's not really so much that you want to get them in a particular frame of mind about the topic, it's that you want to, if possible, reduce their f understandable feelings of mistrust or yes. not liking strangers yes. or not really being open to having the conversation. It, it's, yeah. it's more of a kind of getting rid of a negative rather than creating a positive. And, and we have done the seating thing. Yeah. But I'm just wondering whether you think we can do better than talk about sport and the weather um, yeah. to do that. I think we can. So we've got partners. They can be colleagues, they can be business partners, they can be clients and so on. We have an ex existing relationship. We have a, uh, a, a collaborative history with these individuals. We've it, point to it before the, before the negotiation begins. Point to the fact that we have a history, a collaborative. We have a we have a relationship. Here's another personal example, and it's backed up by the research. So a few years ago, I had uh, a need for some information that I didn't have in my files to complete uh, a report that was due the next day. I knew one of my colleagues at the university in my, the psychology department. I knew he had that information in some research that he had done, but I didn't have access to it. So I sent him an email, and uh, he was sort of a crusty guy. Everybody knew that he, he was a difficult guy to get along with. So I wanted to, to send him an email, email saying, Don, I'm going to contact you, I'm going to call you and ask for some information that you have on this topic, because I don't have it, and I have a deadline tomorrow. And uh, so I called him, and he said, Bob, I, I know why you're calling, and um, I can't help you. Look, uh, I've, I'm a busy man. I, I've got my own tasks. I can't be responsible for your poor time management, <laughs> right? So can't help you. So I had just seen this research, and I didn't say to him what I would have said, which was, Don, this would, I'd really appreciate it if you could help me. This would mean a lot to me. I said, Don, you know, we've been in the same department now for 12 years. I really appreciate it if you could help me. I had the information that afternoon. I just pointed to the existence of a relationship that exists that, that, that was long-standing. And the truth is, people say yes to those in their long-standing relationships. We just have to move it to top of consciousness. That's what all of this is about. Shifting what is prominent in a person's mind in the moment before we deliver the merits of our case and we arrange it in a strategic way. Focusing on the benefits of relationship. The gentleman here, and then if we have time, we're going to come to you. Uh, David Alexander, I'm a, f a fellow here as well. It the subject is very familiar to me of a, a man of 56. We had a whole thing called subliminal advertising, you may recall it. Uh, we also have recently the general data protection regulations coming into force in May 2018, and they require organisations to exhibit transparency about the commercial model and the behaviours that they're undertaking with their customers, and they also require informed consent for certain types of activities to be undertaken. What you're talking about with persuasion is very, very powerful influencing model. But I wonder if simply saying one must consider the ethics is enough. How do we make clear that persuasion is being used as a technique to create the right environment, assuming yeah. everybody's motivations are good? Yeah. How do we actually monitor this so that it is not used for inappropriate purposes? Yeah. Okay, two points to that question. One is... Uh, directly uh, related, and that is instead of providing consumer um, protection 
or information programs designed to get people, recipients, to focus on what is in the message. We need to tell them to focus on what is in the moment before they've received their message. There's influence, there's leverage there that they never considered. Right? Right? Uh, so uh, there's research to show, for example, that in the United States where there are elections, most of the polling places, most of the places where we vote are churches or schools. People are more likely to vote for Republican candidates in churches and more likely to vote for Democratic candidates in schools. Never would they recognize that unless we made that kind of information. Look at the setting in which you're in. Consider the context in which that message, that ballot is going to be considered. Not just the, the thing itself. Right? So that, I think we have to think about instruction to people about the influence process differently. Not just instruction to the communicators, but instruction to the recipients about what aspects of that exchange they have to be cognizant of before they begin it. In, you know that there's research that if you go into a, a, a department store and there are a lot of credit card symbols around, people spend more money even if they pay in cash because credit cards are associated with spending. They're not, it's not like cash where they're also associated with cost. With credit cards are associated with acquiring. Only later do you pay for it with cash. So look around, see if there are those kinds of symbols in the environment that would steer us in a direction. Those are the kinds of things that I think we have to build in to um, the uh, instruction that we provide. So, gentlemen over there, the microphone. And if we have time, we might just squeeze you in. Thank you, Jeremy Kaplan. I'm also a fellow. Jeremy, yeah. My question is about predisposition, and particularly, does this have any impact on recruitment, whether that's recruitment for a call centre or recruitment for a negotiating team? So what could be the learnings? Because if I look at your data, clearly there's an influence, but none of the scores move to 100%. So therefore, there's a spectrum of people who are more or less likely to be influenced or primed or whatever the word is. So how could this influence how you recruit people for a team, a call center team, a negotiating team, etc.? cetera? Yeah. No, I think you're exactly right. That Clearly, we didn't get to 100%. There are other factors that incline people in a one direction or another, including who they, who, what their predisposition are, essentially who they are as a person before that moment. I don't doubt that for a second. And indeed, we have long used those kinds of screens in the uh, recruitment process. We do tests to bring in the people who are similarly minded or uh, who, whose approach is congruent with the goals of the organization and so on. And my guess is that to the extent that we, we give those people momentary focus on that dispositional trait or quality that will elevate their, their likelihood to be motivated and successful in, a, in, in moving in that direction uh, as well. I think we have one more last question. There, so put your hand up. Hi, I'm Sebastian Briggs Williams. I'm also a fellow. Um, we've talked for an hour about persuasion, and I just wondered what about post suasion? And if you've if you've got it wrong first time, what are the chances of being able to save it? Yeah, so, so I, 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 I'm thinking about persuasion a little differently. That is, after you have moved people in a particular direction, how do you solidify that change? How do we get people uh, to continue? We want that change to be durable, after all. 
after we've, uh, we've created. And I'm going to defer to a project that was done by my colleague S Steve Martin here with the National Health Service. Right? There's a big problem with what we call no-shows and also called do, uh, did not attends. People who make an appointment and then they just don't appear for the service. Right? They're not, it's very costly. And we know what happens at the end of each of those uh, uh, appointments. Typically, we get a card from the receptionist at the desk with the date and time of the next appointment on it. What Steve recognized is that if we commit people to that date and time in a more powerful way, they will be more likely to stay true to it. They will be more likely to continue into the future. So what he asked uh, be done is that the patient be handed a blank card and a pen and it asked to write in themselves the date and time of the next appointment. And no-shows dropped by 18% because of something that happened first, an active public voluntary commitment, gave that, that promise legs into the future. Yeah. Wow. Um, I, I feel privileged that someone actually did that to me and gave me that card in an NHS waiting room. So that actually that is true um, at the physio department in St George's. So um, these are all fascinating techniques and um, there are more to tell in the book and I think that you will be signing copies potentially for us outside. So um, please take a, a, the opportunity to do that um, with Robert. But we have run out of time, sadly, so join me in thanking Robert Cialdini. Thank you.